Jerusalem is a fascinating city because it's extremely unique in, in all the cities of the world. It stands alone in more ways than one. But I think some of it, I might say, to understand the place of Jerusalem in history helps us to understand the place of Jerusalem and the meaning of Jerusalem for us because it does have a lot of significance. But I think it's also one of those that is misunderstood. So we're gonna to try to clarify, but we're, going to do, we're actually gonna spend a fair amount of time in the history part of it, because I think it's really important to have that understanding. So Psalm 122, the peace of Jerusalem. The place named Jerusalem, pronounced Yeshulam in Hebrew, is a combination of two words. The first is Yerul, meaning flow. The word has several applications, such as flowing water in a river, the flowing of something to so something flown out of the hand, or is a flowing of a finger in the sense of pointing out a way one should go. This last use is the use in the name Jerusalem. The shalom is from the word shalom, meaning complete and whole. The word shalom is also used also derived from shalom, while it's usually translated as peace, more, more means to be complete or whole. When these two words are put together, the meanings something like pointing the way to completeness. Now this is according to Jeff Banner. So kind of summing this up a little bit, um, the name Jerusalem, or they will see the wholeness or they will feel the awe of the completeness. So it's kind of like pointing the way to completeness. Now kind of here again, studying a little bit of a foundation again, in John 4, 20 through 23, where Jesus is speaking. And the fathers, our fathers worshiped in the mountain and you people, or this woman is speaking to Jesus, and then Jesus answers her. Um, where it means you ought to worship, Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Jesus is establishing this, this truth that Jerusalem was this place where the ch children of Israel would come to worship. The Samaritan woman, they had their own place because they weren't really allowed in Jerusalem. And Jesus is clarifying it because the time has come and now is. In other words, he's talking about that he, the Messiah, was coming, and then later on, the Holy Spirit would be coming to indwell the believers. So the worship necessarily in that place is no longer valid in the same way. It doesn't mean you can't worship in Jerusalem, it just means it's not the same thing because we worship in spirit and in truth because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And Jesus was hinting towards that time coming. But then we gotta go back, where did Jerusalem come from? When, when, when did we first learn about Jerusalem? And if you go back to Genesis 14, 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine now, he was a priest of God Most High. Salem was Jerusalem. Right? So when you read about Salem in, with Melchizedek, um, it was Jerusalem, um, but it was the shortened original name. And as we get along, we're gonna see more name, another name change, a fairly major name change. Then in 2 Samuel, David um, captures Jerusalem, making it the capital city. So it wasn't until David in which Jerusalem became part of the nation of Israel. See, all the way through Joshua and the judges, um, Jerusalem was still a separate city. It was, it was not part of Israel. 
And David was the one that finally conquered it. Because Jerusalem was extremely difficult to conquer, just simply because of, of it, the way it's set up. And then around 1000 BC, Solomon builds the first temple. So now we're starting off, you know, it's not exactly a thousand, but roughly, and nor does it matter that much. But then this piece of land, okay, it's, it's, it's really interesting of the history of the piece of land that the temple is built on. In Genesis 22, verse 2, he said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. In 2 Chronicles 3.11, when Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Isn't that interesting? See, where Abraham was told to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice was where the temple would eventually be built. And even though it was over a thousand years later, and the Lord, where the Lord had appeared to David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Arnon, the Jebusite. And here, Jebusite was a resident of Jerusalem. That's how they got the name. Okay. So now let's go back kind of through history all the way up. Okay. In uh, 586, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. In 539, and then a little bit later, um, Cyrus allows some of the Jews to return, and then Darius allows other, many others to return. And all this is happening in the days of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel. Then in 332 BC, Alexander the Great comes along, and he conquers the then known world, and that's part of it. And then in 63 BC, the Romans conquered the then known world, and Jerusalem was part of it. In 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans and the name is changed. Now this was something brand new. I never heard this before, and maybe some of you have. But they changed the name of Jerusalem to Alina Capitola. Um, Emperor Hayden ordered the construction of Colonel Adlo Capitola in, de in dedication to Juniper Cataplus and to Hayden himself. So he changed the name to um, show two, two things. One, Jupiter, one of, the, one of his gods, and himself. So, and, and that's, you might say, shortly after Jerusalem was totally destroyed in 70 AD. Um, but then the Roman Emperor Constantine changed the name back to Jerusalem in the fourth century. So you have that change, then that actually lasted for over 300 years. Uh, like I said, I never, I never heard about that name before. And then you have the Benetine period of 324 to uh, 324 um, to 638. Now we're into AD. Okay. And then you got the first Muslim period, 638 to 1099, the Crusader period from 1099 to 1187, then Egypt from 1187 to 1259, and then the second Muslim period was in 1250 to 1516, and then the Ottoman period, 1516 to 1917. That was a fairly long stretch in which it was part of the Ottoman Empire. And then you have the British Mandate, which took, started in 1917 to 1948. And then the Divided City. And we're going to look at that. It's a really an interesting little thing, too, the Divided City. In 1948 to 1967, and at that time, during that stretch, Jerusalem was a divided city because part, half of it was part of Israel, the other half was part of Jordan. So the city was divided during that stretch until 1967 war to today where that was unified. So now we have the unified city. All of it seems like this is kind of a bunch of information I really didn't need to know. But we're going to see how so much of this actually fits into history and, God, and God's plan and the psalm we're looking at. Sure. Jerusalem, because of where it's situated, <coughs> land filled with milk and honey? 
a land filled with milk and honey? No. Where, where God told Moses to go. That was. That is the, that is the uh, area, sort of the area. No, the, the land filled flowing with milk and honey that God told Moses to take the children of Israel to is the entire nation of Israel. Well, not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem, not Jerusalem itself. Okay. okay. That's what I was trying to Yeah. That's where I was trying to go. Not Jerusalem itself, but the land. Yeah, but, the, but that's the entire nation. Okay. <laughs> and here's where people sometimes forget to grasp. Okay. Jeremiah 7 4. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. See, in the days of Jeremiah, the Israelites weren't concerned about an enemy going to be able to overthrow them because we have the temple of the Lord. Now, they had totally abandoned God, but they didn't, that didn't matter. What mattered was the fact that because they have the temple, they're safe. The same is true today for people. I've been baptized, so I'm saved. Okay? That same lie. It's all dependent upon this thing or that thing instead of the reality. And what happened shortly after with Jeremiah, the Babylonians came in and hauled everybody off. Okay? They were saying that we're safe. They weren't safe. And then Matthew 23, 37 Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. See, this is Jesus when he wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place in which the children of Israel worshipped God because it was where God came to them. And you had the temple. Okay. Before that, you had the tabernacle. Uh, this is the Old Testament way that things were done. And was, and, but all the times when there was a prophet would come, the leaders, the religious leaders, generally were the ones that uh, caused a lot of difficulty, even killed a bunch of them. Um, you know, over the, over the centuries, and Jesus is saying, "I've tried, I've tried, I've tried to offer you something better." I've sent you warnings, I've sent you notices, I've sent you people to, to warn you, and you simply refuse to follow. You refuse to accept the truth. And then back to how this place, in Galatians 4, 25 and 26. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Now we have the separation again. This concept of you have the physical Jerusalem in the nation of Israel, okay? But there is a heavenly Jerusalem. And we're going to see how this fits again, how, how all of this does eventually come together. In Hebrews 12, 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. In the book of Hebrews, it's clearly talking about this heavenly Jerusalem, which is different than the physical earthly Jerusalem. And the heavenly Jerusalem is made up of the children of God. And then in Luke 21, this is another one of those that gets messed up with people. Luke 21, 20 through 22. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her destruction is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter into the city. Because these are the days of vengeance, so that all the things that are written will be fulfilled. This was a warning that Jesus gave about the coming destruction of Jerusalem that was going to happen in 70 AD. Okay? But when you see the desolation is near, 
the abomination of desolation, which is talked about in Matthew 24, is a parallel passage to this. And we're so used to hearing about this abomination of desolation is the sacrifice of the red heifer and all these other things. Luke clearly clears that up. The abomination of desolation is the armies of the Romans surrounding the city of Jerusalem. And that happened in 70 AD. So that part of this supposed end time prophecy has already been fulfilled a long time ago. It's you got to take the Bible again. you, you got to look at all the passages that relate to something to get you a clear understanding of what is being said. And the other interesting thing, and we know this from secular history and some church history, is that in 70 AD, before the armies actually completely closed off the city, the Christians knew this warning and they left. There were no Christians in the city of Jerusalem when it was destroyed. And then if you want to read something really horrific, read Josephus' account of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And you will be flabbergasted of how it could be so cruel. You had a city that was surrounded by an army. Nobody comes in, nobody goes out. Okay? Nothing comes in, nothing goes out. In the middle of the city, you actually had a civil war going on. And just unbelievable stupidity, I guess. Um, and then the most gruesome part is the stories of where mothers were eating their children because food was so scarce. And then there's a whole bunch of other horror stories that go along with this. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was something horrendously horrible. And this was prophesied by Jesus in the days of vengeance. Now let's get to the psalm itself. And we'll see how this all fits together. Verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Starts off with, I get to go to church today. And I am excited about it. I'm happy about it. I'm glad. I, I really love that. I'm looking forward to it all week long. All right? Verse 2, our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Okay, here again, Jerusalem, my feet are standing, but Jerusalem is this place where God is. And my feet are planted within the gates. In other words, I am inside the place where God is. The house of the Lord, we are inside where God is. The Spirit is with us, is in us, but we are also with Him. Verse 3. Jerusalem that is built as a city is compacted together. In the war in 1948 resulting in Jordan conquering East Jerusalem and Israel taking the West, Jerusalem was divided into two until 1967. When the city was joined back together and solidly united, a city joined together to itself. Joined together, compacted together. The city was joined back together to itself. Okay? And it says that Jerusalem is connected or joined together not with another thing, but together with itself. I think it's important to understand that. Jerusalem wasn't connected to something else. It was, Jerusalem was divided and it was connected back to itself, but we also have the spiritual side to this. Thus, Jerusalem must have a companion. So there had to be East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, or North and South or whatever. So there had to be two Jerusalems to a certain extent, which is true, there are. Because thus, Jerusalem has a companion, another Jerusalem, where's the other Jerusalem? In heaven. The new Jerusalem is in heaven. Verse 4. To which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. See, when it's joined together, the people give thanks to the Lord because and the tribes from all over the earth, all different people gather and come to Jerusalem. 
all the different people around the world come to where God is. All the people around the world come to Christ. Now look at this. The UN designated Jerusalem to be a corpus centerdom in 1947, an international city for all nations. No other city in the world has been set aside to be international like this, belonging to everyone. And if the spiritual Jerusalem belongs to everyone, the gospel of Jesus Christ belongs to everyone. But now this term, okay, which if you're like me, you've never heard it before. I had never until I did this study. Corpus separatum is a Latin term referring to a city or region which is given a special legal and political status different from its environment by which falls sh but falls short of being sovereign or an independent city state. It's the only city in the world that has been designated to have this designation an international city that is not sovereign in and of itself, but belongs to the world all over. Doesn't that fit perfectly with what our God has done for us? We are separated, we are designated totally unique, not like anybody else, not like any other group, but we are separate, but it's separate from but joining together with people from all over the world, all the different tribes and nations. Verse five, for their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. The throne of the house of David, which has lasted forever, which who's seated on that throne, but Jesus himself. In Luke 1, 32, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of our father David. So here the throne that sits in Jerusalem that David sat on, we have the spiritual and we have the heavenly throne which Christ sits on in have the heavenly Jerusalem. And then verse six, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Okay, we all know that shalom means peace. We've, we've all heard that term. Okay. But the root of the word also means complete. So it conveys a notion of well-being and also contains the word paid for. The very name Jerusalem contains the, the root letters complete paid for peace. The heavenly Jerusalem is complete. It's paid for by the blood and it's complete because everyone who is a member of of the house of God, of the family of God, will be. And that peace is only realized in Jesus Christ. Verse seven, may the peace be within your walls and the prosperity within your palaces. Here's what Matthew Henry said about this. And I thought it was great. That means, means for us, the peace and the welfare of the gospel church is to be earnestly desired and prayed for by every one of us. The peace and, peace and prosperity of the gospel message, which is calling us to the spiritual Jerusalem. Then verse eight, for the sake of my brothers and my friends, I now say, may peace be within you. easy one to miss a single word in here which totally changes the meaning if you don't catch it it says may peace be within you not in you within you okay very important because that peace is only within us if the holy spirit is dwelling within us so for all of our brothers and sisters in christ that peace will be in you for the sake of the house of the Lord, verse nine, for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. See, the house of God is a sanctuary. It's been known as a sanctuary, and even, I say, throughout history, quite often, with the exceptions of recently, um, a church was a sanctuary. It was a safe place you could go. If you were having a problem, if somebody was tracing you, um, you could go to the church and at least 
you would have some protection. Even though the force that was chasing you might have been much, much stronger, but the, nobody would dare do anything violent in the church. Okay. Now, that's gone, um, with, the, with rare exception, but that has been true for a long, long time. So Jehovah our God, our protector, our covenant God, um, seeks to include every form of effort to promote it. But the predominant idea of that sanctuary is the intercession. And here again, Jesus Christ is our intercessor. Now, let's sum it all up. Let's try to bring all of this together and see what it comes up to. Sum it up. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem is to pray for the peace of God to be in every child of God. May peace be within you, complete, paid for peace. That peace only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, bought to us, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. So praying for the peace of Jerusalem, yes. But it's not the chunk of land. It's the people of God that gather together to be with him.